during this uh, public workshop for the Kern County Homeless Collaborative Combating Homelessness, presented by Jessica Jansen, Louis Gill, Carlos Baldovinos, Diane Contreras, and Stephen Pels. You're up. Good afternoon, everybody. Or good evening, everybody. My name is Carlos Baldovinos, Executive Director at the Mission at Kern County, but I also served as the Kern County Homeless Collaborative Chair. And this evening, we have uh, several of my colleagues here today. We actually have uh, 26 um, agencies that represent the work that we do. Uh, but this uh, afternoon, we have uh, Jessica Jensen with the United Way that's going to present um, history and background. Uh, then we're going to have um, Diane Contreras. She's going to talk about the county outreach. Then we're going to have Stephen Peltz uh, talk about the housing and point in time counter affordable housing um, update. So with that, I'm going to let Jessica Jensen come up and give our presentation. Good evening, everyone. As Carlos said, my name is Jessica Jansen. I'm with United Way of Kern County. And um, I apologize that Lewis Gill was not able to be here with us tonight, so I'm going to do my best to fill his shoes um, during this part of the presentation. Um, I'm going to talk to you, um, I'm going to give you a little background about the collaborative and services and how those have shifted over the years. Um, you have been provided with the slides. I'm going to move through this pretty quickly to be cognizant of time. So um, you have the slides in front of you. Um, please follow up with us afterwards with any questions you may have. Um, from 2000 to 2009, focus um, on homeless services was on transitional housing and programs. Programs were what we consider high barrier. If you were very active in your addiction, if you had severe mental health issues, those could disqualify you from programs. Housing was only offered to people after they had been stabilized. So after you'd got clean and sober, after you'd addressed your mental health issue, then you were um, deemed eligible for housing. And at that and at that time, everyone was operating under the same federal definition of homelessness. Up until 2009, we functioned under the McKinney-Vento definition of homelessness. Essentially, uh, that definition said the individuals who lacked a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence were considered homeless. You can see a little more specifics on that slide. In 2009, the Hearth Act amended um, the McKinney-Vento definition, and essentially what that did is exclude individuals who were couch surfing or in doubled up situations. Um, they were no longer considered homeless under the Hearth Act. In 2010, the Obama administration launched, launched the Opening Doors Initiative. This was the first time that the federal government had created um, a comprehensive strategic plan to prevent and end homelessness. So we, we talk all the time about, what ending, about ending homelessness in Kern County, but what does that really look like? It doesn't look like that you're never going to see people on the streets experience home, experiencing homelessness. What it does look like is that homelessness will be rare, brief, and non-reoccurring for all populations. We get into the specifics below. Um, it means that all chronically homeless individuals will have obtained permanent housing. Um, every homeless veteran will have been identified and offered housing that no unaccompanied youth and no families with children will experience unsheltered homelessness and they will have all been offered permanent housing. We know that the federal government's focus is on um, ending chronic homelessness and veteran homelessness. So what is chronic homelessness? Someone who is chronic homeless, chronically homeless must have a disabling condition and have been consistently homeless for a year or longer or four, time, four or more times in a three year period that adds up to 12 months. In 2014, um, we were introduced to the Housing First approach, and in 2016, HUD began to re require communities to use a Housing First model. A Housing First model essentially eliminates barriers to housing, so no longer do you have to be stable to receive housing. Um, whether you're active in your addiction, whether you're receiving treatment for mental illness, whether you have an income or not, um, you are able to obtain housing, and what that looks like then is we have case managers um, who provide wraparound services to identify and address the needs of all those individuals. We know that housing first works. Um, in 2017, the Homeless Collaborative conducted a cost-benefit analysis of housing first. We know this is a best practices model. We know that this works, but our question was, is this saving our community money? And the answer to that was a resounding yes. We found that 
Um, Housing First saved our community on average about $28,000 per person per year. It saved our community to house someone rather than maintain them in their homelessness or in emergency shelters. You can also see that um, even after just six months in housing, other things began to decrease. A 98% decrease in jail times, an 88% decrease in inpatient hospitalization. All of that contributed to the cost savings to our community because we know that those are the most expensive points of contact for our homeless individuals. Over the years, we have learned a lot. Um, and there are still things that we that we are working on. We've learned that outreach is critical. That first engagement with our with our homeless community is critical to engage them in services and get them connected to housing. Um, we can directly tie in 2012 the elimination of the redevelopment agencies to an upward trend in homelessness. We know that intense case management is necessary to stabilize people in housing. We also know that shelter beds are necessary so that people have a safe place to sleep while they're waiting to obtain permanent housing. We conduct the point in time count every year, the last 10 days of January. Um, This has become very important for our community. What that allows us to do is gather really good, solid data regarding who is on our streets, who is homeless, and what are the needs of those individuals. We also need to talk about prevention. If we really want to talk about ending homelessness in Kern County, we have to make sure that we have have funding and methods in place to catch people before they even fall into homelessness. So with that, I apologize that was quick. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Diane Contreras. She's going to talk to you about what uh, rural outreach looks like. Good evening, everyone. Outreach. I'd like to um, speak about the importance of outreach. So outreach is a continual relationship building between the outreach worker and those who are experiencing the homelessness and also the community in which they are serving. Um, So it is that constant connection because outreach is that initial contact where that case, that outreach worker reaches someone who wouldn't traditionally seek out services. Um, you know, it is compassionate and it is that touch, that human touch that links that person to hope and to possible um, ultimately a housing opportunity. So the, ser- the areas that we are serving in currently with outreach include the communities of Taft, Lake Isabella, Tehachapi, Mojave, California City, Ridgecrest, Lost Hills, Delano, Shafter, McFarland, Wasco, Arvin, and Lamont. Currently, our community has two and a half outreach workers to cover all of those cities. So Flood has two full-time outreach workers and the Mission of Kern has a part-time outreach worker. What our outreach workers are experiencing in our communities, our rural communities, is the lack of resources. For example, all of our communities don't have a social security office. So in order to serve them, we have to transport those individuals possibly back to Bakersfield to access services through Social Security Administration. Those type of services are important and those are vital to linking them to permanent supportive housing. But what we find is that our rural areas don't always have those services. And so that is challenging both for our person experiencing homelessness and our outreach workers. So really, the, a key component would be to continue to serve as we're serving, but to educate our rural areas on barriers, on realistic and perceived barriers, both to our communities and those that our clients have. Because some of our clients are resistant to services. One, it, possibly could be a mental health issue. It could also be just the the lack of hope, the lack of 
success in the, in the past, to connect to services and see success, and to receive the goal of possibly um, housing. So really, we have to work really hard in making sure we're out in those outlining areas, that we have outreach workers that are both working on those communities to build those relationships and to build the relationship with those experiencing homelessness. So what's working? Um, I can tell you that we at Flood, we have contacted and engaged with 86 individuals in our outlining areas. 66 of those we have continual engagement with and we're moving forward to link them to permanent supportive housing. We have a success of 13 who have already reached that goal and are in supportive housing. And we have 10 that are currently in the process of the process of securing per permanent supportive housing. So it does work, but I'm here just to say that we need to continue the work and we need to grow the work in our communities, um, our surrounding communities. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Stephen. Thank you, Diane. And uh, I am Stephen Pells, the Executive Director of the House and Authority County of Kern. So I want to tell you a little bit about the last point in time count that uh, we did here in Kern County and to also talk about the connection between homelessness and affordable housing. So the point in time count is required by HUD. Every community across the nation does it. Uh, it's required to be done in the last 10 days of January each year. Um, it's not a comprehensive count of homelessness in the of homeless persons in our community because we are only able to count unsheltered people between 4 a.m. and 8 a.m. that designated uh, count day each year. Uh, so depending on the, there's only four hours available and the number of uh, actual counters out there, we're not able to count everybody. And then that's a point in time, so that's that particular day. People become homeless throughout the year. Almost every day of the year, there's a family or person becoming homeless in our county. So it really is just a snapshot. It gives us a makeup of what is the homeless population like. And then we can also tell trends. How is the homeless population changing, increasing, or decreasing? So in 2018, so back in January, we counted 885 homeless persons. Uh, 515 of those were in shelters and 300 and nine were unsheltered in Bakersfield with another 61 unsheltered in other communities. So you see a breakdown there of the individuals that we found in those individual communities. Again, that's not a comprehensive list of all the homeless persons in that community, but it's the ones we were able to find uh, that early morning. So what we found is a pretty substantial increase in homelessness, particularly in unsheltered homelessness in the Bakersfield area. Uh, there was this 46% increase in that uh, category. Overall, a 9% increase in homelessness. In the rural unsheltered homelessness, uh, we had a 5% um, increase, so not as much as in uh, Greater Bakersfield. But as you know, uh, you probably see as you're driving around in our community in Kern County, um, you visibly see more homeless people than you probably saw a year ago. And that's what we found in the count. So we have some data on subpopulations uh, within the homeless population. So uh, chronically homeless people, as Jessica defined earlier, we found 133 of those. Most of those are unsheltered. They're the most visible homeless that you will see on the street. We found 80 homeless veterans. Uh, fortunately, most of those were actually in housing, either transitional or shelters. Um, we found 56 unaccompanied youth. So those are individuals 18 to 24 years of age. Uh, and about half of those were on the streets. And then um, actually 19 uh, parenting youth, which is uh, uh, parents and children. Fortunately, all of those were in shelter, none were on the streets. So the snapshot of 2018 saw that we, we saw a pretty substantial increase in unsheltered homelessness. This chart's really hard to see, so I'm gonna explain. Um, it's really trying to show the long-term trend for homelessness, and what we found is from 2007 to 2017, there was a 58% decrease in homelessness as measured by the point in time count in Kern County. So as a community, as a collaborative, we've been making progress in ending homelessness, but we saw this spike uh, this year. 
One of the common questions people ask is, where are all these homeless people coming from? They've got to be shipping them from somewhere outside the county or uh, LA's doing it. Uh, we find no evidence of that. We actually interview homeless people uh, as part of the census and find out where did they come from. Uh, we found that three-fourths of them were actually in Kern County uh, before they even became homeless. And those that were homeless when they came here, a good portion of them came because they were coming to join family members, to um, connect with other resources. And that's a common thing. We'll, if we find a homeless person in Kern County that has family connections, I'll give you an example of one I know personally, uh, if they have family connections and they've got a sister in Oklahoma that can take them in and provide housing, we will actually, one of our service providers will pay for them to get on the bus and go to Oklahoma so they can connect with that family. So that kind of thing does happen, but actually shipping of homeless people from one community to another is not going on as far as we can tell, and we're out in the streets and in the community on a daily basis. One of the things that we have been able to do is really uh, improve not only the number of homeless resources, including beds and rapid rehousing resources, but also utilization of it. Uh, this chart shows that just from one year, we saw a substantial increase in utilization up to 96% uh, utilization of all of the permanent supportive housing beds that we have uh, in our community. We also have new resources that are coming uh, forth that um, we think will help. Uh, includes domestic violence uh, shelter in, in Delano, additional beds for domestic violence victims in Ridgecrest, uh, 300 new vouchers that uh, the Housing Authority has set aside specifically to house homeless persons in the coming year. Um, new vouchers for veterans, an additional 22 vouchers. And then a new program called No Place Like Home. Uh, we thought it was actually would be started by now. It's caught up in litigation at the state level. But No Place Like Home will uh, provide funding from the state to acquire and rehab or build new housing for homeless, mentally ill persons. Uh, throughout Kern County. Um, and we will be l looking to provide that housing where those homeless persons are. So not only in Bakersfield, but where we identify uh, mentally ill homeless persons in other communities in Kern County, uh, we will be uh, constructing or uh, acquiring that housing. We also uh, ha are in the process of rolling out a coordinated entry system. The idea with coordinated entry is that there's really no wrong door to being able to connect to services and be able to access services quickly uh, and get to the right place at the right time. It's a very comprehensive system to assess the needs of homeless persons and prioritize them to make sure that those ne that have the highest needs get the services uh, first. So I'll talk a little bit about gaps uh, because obviously if we see homelessness going up, we do have some gaps in our community that need to be addressed. Um, clearly affordable housing is, is a huge gap. The, as Jessica mentioned earlier, the ending of uh, redevelopment agencies has significantly impacted the construction and development of affordable housing. Uh, we've also seen a decline in federal investment in affordable housing uh, over the last uh, several years. This is a chart that shows in Kern County the reality of new construction of affordable housing. So if you look at a high point in 2009, we had over 600 uh, units of affordable housing that was that was funded to be constructed in Kern County. That dropped to a low of none in 2016 and only 15 uh, last year. Uh, and you can see it, it's not just a short-term trend, it's been going on for several years uh, due to decline in federal support, due to end of redevelopment agencies, and also due to the increasing cost of developing uh, housing. There's a direct connection here, we believe, between that lack of affordable housing production and homelessness. When people are spending two-thirds of their income or more on rent, it gives them very little margin for a life crisis or something that might happen that could uh, push them into homelessness. So we're not alone in Kern County. Uh, and we're actually doing better than the rest of the state. Uh, overall, homelessness uh, increased 14% uh, in Kern County uh, or in California in the last year. Uh, over one in four uh, homeless persons in the entire nation reside in California. So real quickly, how can Kern County communities help? What role can you play? Um, one is to recruit the landlords that you have in your community. Those mom and pop 
uh, individuals that have maybe one or two units, they may have a duplex or a fourplex that they rent. Um, we have vouchers that we're issuing, or they're basically rental assistance that can support that homeless person with a case manager. Um, but we need landlords that will take those. We also need uh, potential new properties that we can identify to uh, construct small scale um, affordable housing for homeless persons. And then finally, we need uh, more volunteers for the point in time count. We can't get a comprehensive count of the homelessness in your community without having more volunteers. So every year in the fall, we begin that process of recruiting volunteers. So please encourage your community members to participate. Um, it's a life-changing experience. I participate in it every year. I encourage each of you individually to do that and consider that. So that is our presentation, and we welcome any uh, questions you might have uh, given the time allowed. So. Do we have any questions from the public? <coughs> Kathy? I have a question. You talked about uh, coming out in January to volunteer. How did the results come out this past year because you started so early? I mean, it was all dark. It was all nighttime. That, this is the second year we've done had to do the 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. Yeah. Um, it, it does make it much harder because we used to have. But I mean, did you get results that were any different or better? Because I did some volunteer previously. Yeah. Um, it's harder to get volunteers, so that's one thing. I think results we were able to compare 2017 to 18 and know um, that we use the same methods and relatively the same number of volunteers. So mm -hmm. we did find more homeless. So that you showed us that trend more. was okay. increasing, but. It is harder to get people because you essentially have to wake up at 3 in the morning. Well, it's not the fact get of getting there. up. I mean, it's not always that you want to go out in those early morning hours. Absolutely. And it's dark and it's cold. It's January. And people that you're trying to interview are actually sleeping. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so you have to be gently. I, I was being too cautious. Noises. To, so, yeah. But it is, uh, it's very safe. We've never had any incidents with um, safety of the, of the census volunteers. And I would encourage you. Did they don't plan to, do to change the hours? Not at this point, no. no. Um, okay. They say it has to be from dusk to dawn, and we're actually stretching it to, oh, to good eight in the morning because okay. it's definitely dawn by then. So. Okay. Mr. Smith? Thank you. I first just really appreciate all of your work. It's definitely uh, something that we as council members and in the community get concerns about all the time from constituents and, and appreciate that you're trying to help solve a, a critical problem. Uh, and you talked about outreach and the, the city of Bakersfield through Councilmember Gonzalez has just recently gotten additional money for outreach so we can get more people out there and, and work towards the solutions. Uh, so I just appreciate it, thank you. Jennifer? A uh, question that I have for you is uh, if you need to identify volunteers, who would they contact and what would be that number? And should they ask for someone in particular? Me, Jessica. Jessica. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to get you some volunteers. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And we do appreciate, I want to echo that, appreciate that. I mean, I'm from California City. I know that we have uh, homeless individuals. We just don't know how many there are. Uh, it's well, gone. We don't have we don't have yeah, we don't, you know. we don't have services. But, uh, you know, when you ask a law enforcement officer, they'll say, we got five. I, I think it's more <laughs> than five. Because they're, they're people that are squatting in properties as well, so that are, that are not their own. Thank you very much. My question is for Mr. Pels. Um, like we're doing this housing authority in Wasco. Why aren't, why doesn't every HUD or housing authority have five apartments or housing for homeless in every city? Isn't that what this housing should help also? Not just farm workers, but maybe displace families or you know keep vacancies open so so you can help these people um, that's a good point um, there are certain programs that actually uh, prohibit you from setting aside units for homeless so for example right now USDA which supports farm worker housing doesn't allow a specific set aside for homeless persons we think those regulations will probably be changing because there certainly is a lot of emphasis at the federal level uh, for ending homelessness we are looking as a housing authority on how we could prioritize uh, units, just as we prioritize vouchers, prioritize our own units for at least a portion of them for homeless persons. Right. I, I mean, Great that's point. what mm -hmm. 
our tax dollars are for is to help uh, people too also right absolutely yeah i mean i would support that i i don't know why we don't do more of that but that's me thank you thank you mrs uh chair real quickly uh um, for the housing authority folks that are here um is there a program to help supplement rent and utilities i know we have you know through our uh, mcfarland we have our um our family resource center and they do help with some assistance but for homeless or people that may find themselves homeless because seasonal work has ended and they don't have means to transport anywhere else uh, but yet they may have a you know uh, there may be renting since they're working they, they can afford their rent is there affordable or some type of uh, uh, subsidizing uh, or supplemental income or revenues to help with rent so we do have um, rental assistance vouchers that are set aside specifically for homeless persons um, they are prioritized for people who have the most vulnerable, highest priority needs, so they're okay. most vulnerable, and with the longest history of homelessness. So we have a whole process where we evaluate each individual or family to determine where they rank in that, and those that rank the highest and have the highest needs will actually get those vouchers. So there are not enough for every person who experiences homelessness, okay. but for those that have the most severe needs certainly there also is rapid rehousing which is a limited resource but is available which provides short-term assistance to help with getting a deposit and maybe just a couple months mm -hmm. rent if they have an ongoing income source and is that something that's um, that they would go for example McFarland family in McFarland where would they go would be refer them to somewhere here in Bakersfield or so the big so for rapid rehousing the Bakersfield homeless center actually okay. provides it but do you want to talk about the quick referral too real quick or do you want to yeah. how to do it okay. yeah. So as we launch our coordinated entry system, um, we do have a focus on our, our rural communities. And um, as Diane spoke about, flood is in um, all, of, all of our outlying cities. And so one of the, the ways we identify people is through what's called um, an access point that utilizes a quick referral tool. So um, any agency that essentially engages with homeless on a somewhat regular basis um, that is accessible by public transportation um, and that is ADA compliant and has um, language services, if you meet those, that, those four criteria you can become an access point as an access point you would utilize the quick referral tool so essentially say your family resource center um, a family walks in and says we're in need of housing we are having a housing crisis we're homeless um, you ask them a series of just three or four questions to um, to identify where the best um, point of contact is to um, like Stephen said assess them measure their vulnerability and essentially get the match to housing mm -hmm. so that's something I'm working on um, making sure that all of our agencies uh, that are touching this population are trained in that so they can make a good referral so that's kind of how we're identifying people and getting them connected through our coordinated entry system ultimately to housing so for if you have a um, family resource center then that would be the agency that you would be working with uh, or that we would refer people because I'm assuming that that's the only place we know right now in McFarland unless it's a church or, uh, or some other faith-based organization Sure, yeah, so they could become an access point, and that means that if you encountered someone, you could say, you know, go to the Family Resource okay. Center, they'll ask you a couple questions, and they're going to refer you to the most appropriate resource, okay. which would be one of four places, either the Homeless Center, the Mission at Kern County, Flood Ministries, um, the Housing Authority, five actually, okay. and Clinica Sierra Vista. Okay. And then they, um, those agencies are tasked with following up with that family or individual, assessing them e either over the phone, in the field, um, whatever works best, and ultimately getting them connected to housing. Okay. Thank you. We have another meeting in one minute. You can uh, hook up with her after the meeting, maybe. Or That's fine. Her information. We're good. We're good. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your presentation. We appreciate it. Call this meeting to order. Please stand for the flag salute. Salute and pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Gorilla. Present. B. Smith. I am here. Wood. I am here too. Vallejo. Mock? Cantu? Present. Mauer? Here. Prout? Yes. Pryor? Here. P. Smith? Here. Wegman? Here. Couch? Scrivener? Here. Miller? Here. Dermody? Here. 
Para Kiernan. Thank you. Item three, public comments. <laughs> this portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the committee on any matter not on this agenda, but under the jurisdiction of the committee. Committee members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may ask a question for clarification, make a referral to staff for factual information, or request staff to report back to the committee at a later meeting. Speakers are limited to two minutes with the authority of the chair to extend the time limit as deemed appropriate for conducting the meeting. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making a presentation. Do we have any public comments? Seeing none, item four, consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by Kerncog staff and will be approved by one motion if no member of the committee or public wishes to comment or ask questions. If comment or discussion is desired by anyone, the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered in the listed sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the committee concerning the item before action is taken. We have items A through K. Motion to approve consent. I'll second. Roll call vote. Garola? Yes. B. Smith? Yes. Wood? Yes. Vallejo? Yes. Cantu? Aye. Mauer? Aye. Prout? Yes. Pryor? Yes. P. Smith? Yes. Wegman? Yes. Scribner? Aye. Miller? Yes. Dermody? Yes. Item 5. Intelligent Transportation Systems ITS Current Update Deliverable Review. Ms. Pacheco. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the committee. The draft regional ITS plan is available for review. Comments are due May 23rd. The plan will be brought back to this committee for approval in June. And at this time, I do want to present Alyssa Fineau. She is with Kimley Horn and Associates. She has prepared a seven minute presentation and the slide copies are in your folders. So at this time, I ask through the chair, would you like Alyssa to present the slides? Yes. Thank you very much. As Raquel said, my name is Alyssa Fan of with Kimley Horn and Associates. Um, closer to my mouth, thank you. Um, Raquel will be bringing up the presentation right now. The ITS or Intelligent Transportation Systems Plan is a strategic plan that we've developed for the Kern region. It's a culmination of several, of over 15 months of, it went away. of over 15 months of stakeholder involvement and stakeholder engagement. The, um, we had a series of workshops over the last 15 months to engage the stakeholders and identify what their needs are for the region. We've prepared many deliverables that are available for review on the current ITS website and in your package here. Um, it's a stakeholder-based plan. The vision from the community is the through community ITS investment, coordination and data sharing between transportation agencies for, to make travel in current safe and efficient. As we were developing the ITS transportation plan, we have developed operational roles and responsibilities for the stakeholders in the region. This explains how the systems and transportation um, op operations will occur now and into the future. The planned responsibilities for our stakeholders were directly related to a prioritized project list. This project list is based on the needs of the stakeholders, the needs for the functionality uh, to make sure that logical antecedents could uh, combine to form a, an, a series of operating projects. Now these projects that we've developed for the region are, are broken into three categories, short, medium, and long-term implementation. These, plan, these projects are recommendations, they're not a prescription, that doesn't necessarily mean they're fully funded. But what this strategic plan will enable you to do is go after additional federal and state sources of funding because you have a stakeholder-driven plan 
that builds on existing technology to plan for future technology to help solve the transportation issues in the region. Inside the plan, you'll see a prioritized list of projects. Part of the architecture is to develop these information flow diagrams. What these diagrams do is explain how the different transportation systems will operate and talk to each other, exchanging data. The plan is, for th is to keep this up to date, so it's, uh, a an, it's an evolving plan that responds to your needs as your needs change over time. There is a maintenance process led by Kern Cog. Uh, there is a maintenance <coughs> committee that um, will review the plan to understand if there are updates happening in the region and make changes as, as, uh, as they're necessary. The next steps for the project, as Raquel mentioned, our comments are due. Then we, um, we will present a, a TTAC recommendation for approval and finally for approval from, from the Kern Cog Board. Are there any questions? No questions. Thank you. I was at seven minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Chair, if I may, um, like she mentioned, all the information is on our website. Um, I do have CDs, though, if anybody would like a CD of all the documentation. As well, there's a couple of paper copies of just the plan itself, not the appendices. So if anybody would like those. All right, great. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Any questions from the public? Thank you very much. Item number six, 2018 Community Survey Final Report, Ms. Campbell. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Our uh, 2018 Community Survey is complete. Uh, the survey, this is the 12th year that we've been doing this survey in consecutive years, which has enabled us to do, uh, see trends in the questions that we've been asking. Godby Research was commissioned to conduct the survey again this year, and one new feature that they were able to offer was invite participants to do the survey online. We have the final report on our website, which you should have a link on your staff report, and Brian Godby is here tonight to do the actual presentation of the report, uh, which now I have to do the technical stuff. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Suzanne. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, I am Brian Godby, and I'm pleased to be here uh, yet again for our annual survey. Uh, there's, uh, as Suzanne mentioned, uh, quite a bit of information. If you look at the uh, 12 years of data, uh, we're going to try to sum it up uh, in just uh, a few more, a uh, few minutes, rather than looking at all of that data. So, okay. Uh, let me go. Yeah, that's a good you place go to back start. one? Uh, yeah, no, that's, uh, that's fine, I think. Um, there we go. Uh, as uh, you just heard, the purpose was to uh, look at the overall opinion uh, and the future quality of life uh, in the county, uh, to look at specific issues that are related to the future quality of life and what are most important. Uh, uh, yeah, me too. Okay, got it. Uh, to understand the daily commute behavior and to look at housing preferences uh, in the county. There's also, for each of the years, including this one, a wealth of demographic information uh, that is available in the full report. Uh, in terms of the uh, interview methodology, this was a telephone and online, as was mentioned. Uh, the universe that we looked at was all of the adults 18 plus. Uh, we were in the field in the beginning of February through the beginning of March. The average phone survey was about 22 minutes long. We don't know how long it takes people to do it online, uh, whether it's from an email invitation or a text invitation, uh, because they can walk away from their computer or their uh, cell phone or their whatever device they might be taking it on and come back later. What we do know is that they now s hit the final submit button 24 hours a day. So we're finally able to interview them on their schedule rather than on our schedule, which uh, is a dramatic improvement, I think. Uh, in terms of the sample, the uh, total was 1,434 adult residents. Uh, 49 of them came from an email invitation. 166 were cell phone calls. 424 were landline calls. And 795 were text invitations to an online survey. Uh, which shows, and what we're seeing all over the state in the last year, is uh, text 
is become ubiquitous. We all do it regardless of age, uh, gender, or ethnicity. Uh, it's, uh, it is ubiquitous. Uh, that, uh, we also did 39 interviews conducted in Spanish, uh, and that gives us an error rate of plus or minus 2.58 percent. Uh, you can round that to three just to make it easy. As we have in previous years, we started off with a question about the current quality of life and whether they were satisfied or not. Uh, the question is pretty straightforward. It's very satisfied, somewhat satisfied, somewhat dissatisfied, or very dissatisfied. Uh, and what you instantly see here is a trend that we've seen for about the last five years, starting in Northern California and then creeping around the entire state. Um, the quality of life satisfaction is going down. Um, and it, we think uh, that that's related to uh, sort of the inverse of the economy getting better. Uh, as the economy gets better, traffic, housing, air quality all become issues going the wrong direction. Uh, and that has an impact in the overall quality of life, and you'll see a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, this time, the total satisfied was 72.4%. Uh, in 2017, it was 83.5, uh, and it was um, about that same 83 back in, if we go back to 2012, it went up a little bit, uh, and now it's going back down. The future outlook is a little, uh, little more stable, about 34 percent if you add the much better and somewhat better, uh, think the future quality of life will be improved. Uh, in 2017, that was 38 percent, so statistically with that 3 percent error rate and plus, it's plus or minus, so you have to look at both items, they have to be about 6 percent different and there isn't really a difference between 2017. There, there's just barely a difference between uh, this year and 2016. Uh, but it's all pretty much in the same range. The next question that we asked was, what do you like most about living in your uh, city or town? Uh, and th at the top of the list again this year was the small town atmosphere. Uh, it's come down a little bit to 37% in round numbers. It was 41 in 2017. Uh, but again, statistically, that's not really significant. Uh, cost of living uh, is important, uh, as you can see, as the cost of housing uh, and then location are the top four, uh, four items on the list this year. The question that I referenced a minute ago, which I think is important to look at, is what do you like least about uh, your city or town? And this, as the previous one, was an open-ended question, so we're not forcing them into these categories. These are the categories that we group them in after they respond. Um, and what you see here is the top four items have gone up by significant amounts. So this is, again, the things they don't like. Number one is air quality. That's at 47. That was 32 in 2017. So that's a big jump uh, in just one year. Crime rate uh, is 38. That's up eight points from 2017. Uh, gang violence is at 30 in round numbers. Uh, that's up 10 points since 2017. Lack of community resources uh, is up a smaller amount um, from 2017. Uh, and then traffic congestion is up about seven points from 2017. Uh, so you see some of the reasons why people are less satisfied. And they're, they're, again, the, all those top items are up. So uh, that's uh, a, an important finding. But not unusual because, as I said, we started seeing this trend five years ago um, in Northern California. It was specifically in the city of San Rafael, which we've done similar surveys over the last uh, 20 years uh, to yours. Uh, and we started noticing it up there. Obviously, the economy turned around in parts of Northern California probably first, particularly associated with the technology industry. The next uh, question is really a long set, and I'll try to make this as uh, digestible as possible, but it, it, there's a lot of data here. Uh, we asked a variety of questions and asked people how important they thought it was, uh, each one of these items, to the future quality of life. Uh, and the scale was extremely important, was a four, then there's a three, two, one, and zero was not at all important. Uh, the top seven items for the future quality of life were improving the quality of public education, uh, imp 
improving crime prevention and gang prevention, which ties into those items that we were just talking about, preserving water uh, supply, preserving water quality, improving air quality, again, one of those items we just heard talked about, uh, creating more high paying jobs and maintaining local streets and roads. So those are the top seven most important items for the future quality of life. Uh, because we've been doing this for so long, we've got a lot of data that shows how the, each of these items, and they were grouped in different sets, uh, compare over the years. Uh, so I'll just try to do this quickly. Uh, in the economic vitality and equitable services category, we had creating more high paying jobs and encouraging new businesses to relocate to the county. Both of those are down a little bit, but virtually the same as they were uh, in 2017. Uh, the next item is community assets and infrastructure. Uh, here we had revitalizing older neighborhoods and business districts and creating a more affordable housing. Uh, both of those are down a little bit, but statistically they're really tied. The next one is transportation uh, choices, and actually that goes on to the next slide as well, obviously important, uh, including expanding highways, reducing traffic congestion, maintaining local streets and roads, and expanding local business services. Uh, all of those, too, were down um, with the exception of maintaining local road, street and roads, and it's basically equal. Uh, there's not much of a difference from one year, uh, 2017 to 2018. The remainder of that category, improving public transportation to other cities, uh, that was down, and that was down significantly uh, as uh, something that will help the future quality of life, which is sort of interesting. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have follow-up questions to ask why is that, but that certainly stands out. Uh, maintaining and improving sidewalks and bike lanes and public transportation and carpooling were down uh, in terms of the importance uh, towards the future quality of life as well. Uh, the next category was conserving undeveloped land and natural resources. Uh, the first one, air quality, was of equal importance. Basically, there's no statistical difference um, to what it was before, uh, and we saw that as an important issue in that open-ended question. Uh, preserving water supply was down a little bit, but per preserving water or improving water quality was up. Uh, but not really statistically significant. Uh, and then finally, preserving open spaces and native animal habitats down slightly. And the next category was uh, efficient development where appropriate, uh, developing a variety of housing options. Uh, that's less important to the future quality of life than it was before, but again, statistically, it's about the same. Uh, services and safety and equity, uh, improving fire emergency uh, s medical services down a little bit, uh, improving health care uh, and social services the same, uh, improving crime prevention and gang prevention programs the same, uh, and improving local libraries uh, is not one that we tested this time, but we've left it on the chart uh, from the past. Again, these are down in terms of their contribution to improving the future quality of life not that they're down in terms of the service itself. Uh, so at that point, we switched gears after that long set of questions uh, and started talking about transportation choices. The first one what's, is, was mode choice. What's your primary transportation used to get to work or school? Um, and not surprising, given what we've talked about traffic already, traffic is up seven, or I'm sorry, drive alone, Creating traffic is up 7% from 2017 and, in fact, is the highest level we've ever seen it. Um, so uh, people are making different choices, maybe not the one we would prefer, uh, but they are certainly making different choices. Uh, when you look at carpooling, that's up a little bit, but not statistically significant. And the corresponding one is public transit, and that's down 2.6%, uh, not statistically significant. Uh, like the drive alones are on the upside, but certainly explains for some of the drive drive alone going uh, going up. Uh, the next slide just shows the remainder of the items, that, and they're all uh, well within the margin of error on the downside: walking and Uber and taxis and others. The next question asks people uh, to rate the traffic flow in their city or town. 
Uh, and again, this seems to be tracking with the other questions that related to traffic. In 2018, 41% uh, said it was excellent or good, but that was down almost 15% from 2017. Uh, so the fare went up, fare uh, rating went up to 44% in round numbers, and the poor went up to almost 15%. Um, so obviously the more drive alones and the concerns that we saw about traffic earlier uh, are borne out in this question as well. Uh, the next couple pages show uh, first the average commute time uh, and then show the uh, average distance. Um, as you can see here, uh, the 10 minutes or less is about the same as it was in 2017, uh, and that was the high water mark uh, in both years. Uh, then we've got 11 to 20 minutes where we're up a little bit in that group. And, and in reality, I think we want people to have shorter commutes, so we'd like to see the, these bottom categories go up uh, and the longer commutes go down. Uh, but, um, and that's true at the 21 to 40 minutes. But then when we get to 41 to 60 minutes, that group has actually increased um, from 15% to 16 and a half. So it's not a huge amount, but it's certainly not the way we'd like it to go. Uh, and then the more than 60 minutes is basically the same as it's been uh, for the last several years. Again, the next question was how many miles do you commute? Uh, ideally, we'd like people to move closer to their work, so the shorter distances are is sort of what we'd like to see, and five or less and six to 10 um, are actually up from pre the previous year, uh, so that's good, but 11 to 20, uh, and maybe that's sort of a midpoint is down. Uh, a couple points, it's 22 in round numbers now, it was 24 last year. Uh, and then the longer distances, uh, 21 to 40 miles are down slightly from the previous year, but the more than 40 miles are up slightly from the previous year. And then the next uh, transportation related question was really a follow up from the first mode choice and it was simply what is the most likely alternative transportation you would take if it were available. Uh, carpool is the highest at 17 and a half which is identical to what it was in 2017. Uh, traditional bus service down a little bit from 2017 as was uh, e express bus service, walking and Uber or Lyft. Uh, biking was uh, the one that was up a little bit uh, from the previous year. The next couple questions uh, dealt with the um, current housing type. Oops, I think I went too far. Yeah, there we go. Uh, housing issues. So first thing we asked people, what kind of house do you currently uh, live in? And um, 35 36% percent in round numbers said a single family home with a small yard. 51% uh, said a single family home with a large yard. 2% uh, a townhouse or condominium. Uh, half a percent in a mixed use building. Uh, and then 9% in an apartment. The following data, which I won't go into in great detail because it just tracks the same information over, uh, over the years. Uh, the first two are down a little bit, and then when we get to the last three, the building, um, the mixed use building basically is up a little bit, but it's such a small number of people, it's hard to tell if that's a real change or not. Uh, the next chart, uh, which is the most interesting, I think, uh, is where you look at the house type that the people currently have and what they would like to have. Uh, so if you look at the columns, that's the house housing type that they currently have. So the first column is they live in a single family uh, home with a small yard. Uh, of those people, if they moved, 74% uh, would stay in a single family home with a small yard, uh, but 73% would like to move to uh, a large yard. Everybody got asked all of these questions, so it's not like there's 140% of people, it's uh, the total for each option that they might consider. Uh, when we look at single family with small yard, or with large yard people in the second column, the, the option for the small yard goes down dramatically because they already have a big yard and that's what they want. Uh, and so that goes down to 61, but you see that 78% uh, are still um, want to stay at their single family home with a large yard. Uh, and so you can do the rest of that with the other columns. They're smaller numbers because of 
uh, the distribution of housing, uh, people that live in a townhome or condominium, the biggest group would like to be in a mixed use, would consider a mixed use building of some sort. Uh, and then uh, skipping over the mixed use people because again it's a small percentage those in apartment uh, the first choice they have really would be to move to a single family home with a large yard so that concludes the presentation there is also an executive summary which I won't go through because it just says exactly what I just talked about <laughs> uh, so I'll save you time but if you want to read read it later it's certainly available so I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have do you have any questions from the public? Any questions from the board? Thank you. Thank you. We'll need a motion for this. Yes, you need to vote to accept the report. Okay. Do we have a motion? Second. Second. Oh. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. We have addendum to the agenda, 6A, resolution regarding a California Energy Commission grant award. Ms. Urata. Good evening. Kern Council of Governments, in partnership with the Center for Sustainable Energy, submitted a grant proposal to develop a comprehensive Kern electric vehicle blueprint plan that will recommend high-impact projects within each of our member agency communities. The California Energy Commission awarded our project $200,000 on May 9th. In order to move forward with the contract process, the CEC has requested a resolution from your committee authorizing KernCog staff to move forward with the contracting process. Staff requests that the committee directs us to enter into separate contract negotiations with A, the California Energy Commission, and B, the Center for Sustainable Energy. Um, we plan to bring those contracts back to the board on June 21st, your next meeting. Um, so we ask you to authorize the chair to sign um, resolution 18-22, and this requires a voice vote. All right. Do we have a motion? I move staff's recommendation. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? There you go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Executive Director's Report. No? no? Oh. I already saw none, 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 so. <laughs> Caltrans Report. Sorry, Gail. Didn't mean it. No offense taken. Okay. Good evening. And I'm going to. S oh, yeah. Oh, maybe I just, yeah, need to be closer. So let's start off with Formosa 4699 bridge replacement. Uh, the bridge will be, the bridge work will be starting in the median. Import borrow operation will continue until the end of the month. And then moving on, that was a short one. Uh, the uh, State Route 99 Taft Highway uh, Rehabilitation near the city of Bakersfield from north of Herring Road over crossing to Pacheco Road under crossing. Caltrans, or the contractor has closed the outside lane from White Lane to just south of Panama Lane to facilitate the replacement of the outside lane. This work is currently being done behind the K-Rail with nightly closures uh, from Sunday night to Thursday night. Medium vegetation trimming south of 119 this will be done during the day with medium shoulder closures Monday through Friday. State Route 46, uh, that's widening State Route 46 from two lanes to four lanes, conventional highway between Lost Hills Road and I-5. Abutment 1 and 5 are in settlement period for 90 days. Contractors place the K-Rail at I-5 and 46. Contractor construction embankment for ramps four, five, and six. Chevron needs to remove the abandoned pipes. Con construction does not have, we don't have a, currently have a schedule from Chevron for that work. The Lost Hills water line will be relocated the next three weeks. If these utilities are not relocated, um, then the project may see some delay. So hopefully they'll stay on schedule. We had some wonderful Swenson hawks 
decide to move into the area. They're 550 feet from the project. However, the contractor uh, was able to work with a biologist to get a permit from Fish and Wildlife. So um, that was a da uh, disaster, a costly disaster avoided. Good. Now, uh, Cottonwood East Rehabilitation, Pavement Rehabilitation on State Route 58 in Bakersfield from Cottonwood Road Undercrossing to just east of the 58 and 184 separation. No major changes. Uh, project started on April 2nd. Contractor is working through required submittals and has started the first stages of work. This project will be completed um, this time next year. So I'll be reporting on that for quite some time. I've got the uh, State Route 65 rumble strips, um, and that's from 7th Standard Road to north of Avenue 196. Um, contractor has completed centerline rumble strip and striping operations. However, they still need to um, install the traffic loop detectors, which are currently scheduled for tomorrow. Current 33 and 119 rumble strips, that centerline rumble strips, um, and that's going to be on various locations on State Route 33 and 119. They expanded the scope of this project to include additional rumble strips, um, and right now they're looking for the funding in order to make these improvements. There was another, the original project um, is actually pretty much completed, if not already completed, but they decided that they found some additional information that required that they add some additional rumble strips. Now it's just finding the money, which from what I gather, they're confident that they're gonna do that. Um, now I would like to just take an opportunity to talk about State Route 43, which um, thanks to Cheryl Wegman, she brought this to our attention and there's been some issues out there and so traffic investigations went out and did a two-mile investigation on that se on the segment on State Route 43 between Peterson Road and Schuster Road, and then also on um, Pond Road. They found that there was no pattern of cross center line accidents between these li limits. However, Caltrans is uh, trying to be proactive with regard to rumble strips. So anytime that we have a project, we feel it's in our best interest and it certainly is um, a safety precaution to install rumble strips wherever we can. So as soon as there is a project out there, we're going to be doing that. Um, however, on, at 43 and Pond Road, um, that intersection, we actually have decided to put um, the solar power flashing beacons on northbound and southbound approaches. And that is going to happen, um, the bids are gonna go out in July, and the installation of this equipment should be done around January, February. So thank you, Great, thank we appreciate you. it. And that concludes, oh, I, if there's no questions then we'll let Ryan Through talk. The Madam Chair, yes. uh, real quickly for Caltrans, uh, Gail, um, I'd say in the last month or two, there's been some major fatalities on 43, either between Shafter and Wasco and then uh, all the way up through, um, you know, heading up towards those areas that you identified or Ms. Uh, Ms. Wegman identified. Um, so I want to thank you guys for definitely adding some extra lighting out there. Obviously, a lot of these issues have been caused by drunk driving. And um, so I, you know, I, I know that these are county roads. I'm not sure how, you know, how, who, and how do we, we address some of these issues because some of it is in, uh, I guess, Tulare County, yeah. not so much uh, Kern County. So I really appreciate your guys' uh, effort because as our communities grow, McFarland, Delano, Wasco, there's a lot more traffic yeah. going through 43. And so that is, uh, for everyone here, that is definitely a, a strip of uh, a road that we start need looking at uh, because it's becoming very congested as our communities grow north of Bakersfield. Okay? Yeah. So thank you, Gail. Thank we you. It's definitely on our radar, so thank you. Thank you, Gail. My turn. Good <laughs> evening, everybody. Uh, Gail and I actually called each other, tried to compete to see who could have the most colorful outfit. I think you know who won. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, 
anyway, it's nice to see all you. I do want to uh, introduce someone I have. I brought with me from Bishop tonight. It's Terry Earlwine. Terry, say hi. <laughs> Terry is our maintenance and operations deputy for District 9, so she does the day-to-day -day stuff with the maintenance forces as well as traffic operations. So anything you uh, want to complain about, go ahead and talk to Terry. <laughs> anything positive, come to me. That's R good. R Ryan, Ryan, can you yeah. remind everyone where the boundaries are between District 9 and 6? Yeah, that's a good point. I'll, I'll bring a map next month when I come back because we do have a map we created for the local agencies that we work with. And I think it's about what Caliente turn off on State Route 58 and then, okay, what was that? General Beale, General Beale Road, thank you. And then also Weldon area. But we'll bring the map so then you'll have it. So, yes, we have the eastern part of the county. Um, real quick, I want to go over some of the projects we have in the planning stages, and, and these will take some time to get through to construction but just let you know that there's some big ticket items that are coming in the future for the eastern part of the county uh, first off i have the mojave rehab on state route 14 which is within the community of mojave we have the mojave to boron freeway conversion which i know mayor wood sitting next to me has already hit me up to get that 140th connection going um, we're writing the pid for that freeway conversion right now however beyond pid i have no funding at this point in time but Gail said she was going to give me some, so we're good. <laughs> no. So I'm going to need some help on that as we go forward, looking for grants or, or ear, potential earmarks or anything. So at least we were able to write a PID this year, and that's huge. Um, the next thing I have on here from the planning stage is, is a Tehachapi rehab on State Route 58 in and near Tehachapi. That's a huge project. Um, in environmental stage, I have the Rosamond Mojave rehab, which is south of Mojave, so it's currently in the environmental process that goes from the Kern County line basically just south of Mojave um, starting July 1st for environmental we will be working on the Cummings Valley turn pocket on State Route 202 near Tehachapi and then in design July 1st we start design on the Freeman Gulch segment 2 portion which is the middle portion of segment of uh, State Route 14 widening for four lanes and then of course on the heels of that we actually have a Freeman Gulch 1 segment in construction which is a handout a lot of you have and we are having a ribbon cutting coming up next month we hope to see a lot of you there it's gonna be at 930 in the morning hopefully it will not be too hot at that time we know how warm it gets in that part of the county in June and then last I did pass out this pretty map we pass this out about every April May this time it, you know it's it's here it's bigger this year usually it's eight and a half by 11 now it's 11 by 17 or ledger if you will and it shows what projects we plan to go to construction this summer because even if you have a plan for construction not everything goes perfect you may have a contractor issue uh, asphalt issue or something else kind of issue like Swainson and hawk shows up and whatever so this is our plan so uh, it has quite a bit it has quite a bit on the maintenance side for, for now but a lot of the projects i just mentioned earlier we would not be able to do without sb1 so just uh thank you thanks for bringing that up so with that i'm done if anybody has any questions oh sorry pid is a project initiation document that is where we initially start figuring out what it's going to cost to do certain alternatives of a project so that's when we really get into cost estimating any questions thank, thank you, you. Executive Director's Report. Good evening, Madam Chair and Board Members. I have uh, about eight quick items for you. Yesterday and today, the California Transportation Commission met in San Diego, and I'm happy to report that Kern Cog applied for and was ordered uh, awarded a $25 million grant for the City of Bakersfield to complete an important portion of Centennial Corridor. Congratulations to all who played a part in that. Uh, as Ryan mentioned, the Freeman Gulch a ribbon cutting is June 12th. I'll be speaking at that event. If any of you would like to come and join me, uh, you're, I'm more than willing to carpool or meet you there. Uh, the, one of the items that was on consent this evening was the TDA Article 3 program. Just a reminder, that's uh, where your communities can get um, funds for bicycle or pedestrian work directly from the COG. Um, it's been a source for uh, bicycle parking before, bicycle safety. The deadline for that is July 16th. 
Um, this is a, a statewide issue that's beginning to affect all of our communities. The number of bidders on our projects is is down significantly in the last uh, six months. Um, and along with that, construction costs are rising. So uh, please give a heads up to your staff and um, please be understanding when they told you tell you that they in some cases may need more money to award projects. Uh, it's good news though because there's much, much more work uh, coming out there but along with that comes rising costs. Um, Gail also mentioned uh, work is underway in Lost Hills at I-5 and 46. Along with that comes increased congestion uh, in that area. So please if you're going to the coast uh, allow some extra time or take an alter alternative route. Uh, I'm sure Mayor Prout would appreciate you taking Lairdo Highway and going through uh, <laughs> Shafter instead of 46. Uh, staff specifically, Suzanne Campbell ha has been in negotiations with Bolt and Megabus. Those are both uh, long haul bus companies that uh, have reserved seats, internet. If you travel on I-5 you may have seen the blue double-decker buses that go between Los Angeles and San Francisco. And cross your fingers, but maybe by uh, this summer we may be having a stop for both of those companies uh, in Kern County. We'll, we'll let you know and keep you updated. Federal government let us know um, last week that all of your cities and the county will see increases in your RSTP funds and that might come in handy, especially with the prices going up. We don't know uh, the amount of the increase. We should know the increase um, sometime next week, but it's roughly $2 billion nationwide, so it will be our share of that $2 billion. If any of you use Amtrak, you may have seen the construction that's been ramping up for the past um, several months. We were within about two months of finishing that project and part of that project that is funded with a variety of sources will be uh, free electric vehicle charging, some of the first uh, in the metro Bakersfield area. And finally this evening, some of you have talked to me recently about um, how uh, your constituents can get uh, van pools. So there, there was a major change in uh, Los Angeles County which affects uh, many people that commute to Edwards Air Force Base and in some cases China Lake and Eastern Kern. So Enterprise bought a company called V-Ride and that has affected many people that use van pooling in Eastern Kern. Um, I've invited the head of CalVans who's been here before to make a presentation uh, specifically about how your constituents can get on board with uh, van pooling and he'll be here in August. Subject to any questions, Madam Chair, that concludes my report. Any questions for Mr. Hakimi? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm just kind of curious. You mentioned about uh, possibly knowing next week what kind of a STP fund increase there would be. Is that notification coming from COG to the current cities as to what, what you know, the amounts are, or how will we know? A absolutely, Mayor. We, we will, as soon as we have those numbers, we'll... we'll send that out to your staffs and I'll also send it out to all of you. Okay, thank you. That's it. Moving right along. We'll go into, do we have any member statements? No, nope. let's move right along to the current Council of Governments agenda. Roll call stays the same. Okay, thank you. Public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the council on any matter not on this agenda but under the jurisdiction of this council. Do we have any public comments? Seeing none. The consent agenda. All items of the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non controversial by Kern Cog staff and will be approved by one motion if no member of the council or public wishes to comment or ask questions. The consent agenda is items A through D. Do we have a motion? Second. Roll call vote. Garola? Yes. B. Smith? Yes. 
Wood? Yes. Vallejo? Yes. Cantu? Aye. Mauer? Yes. Prout? Yes. Cryer? Yes. P. Smith? Yes. Wegman? Yes. Scrivener? Yes. Item four, final Kern Cog for year 2018-19 financial plan, Mr. Palomo. Good evening. <coughs> Excuse me, Chairman, Madam Chairman Wegman and members of the board. This is, as she mentioned, the 1819 final draft for Kern Cog's budget. You have seen this document three times already, and the quickest way I can describe is that it covers everything um, in the overall work program that you just approved on the consent agenda. Revenue-wise, we're down about 8 percent. It's not significant. The only significant thing I'd like to mention is the mix of the revenues. Typically, we're pretty federal funding heavy. This year, we're taking advantage of some of the SB1 state funds while they're available and some local funds. Expenditure-wise, it's pretty typical. Uh, most of our budget is in personnel. We have some consultant agreements out there as well as some services and supplies. The small capital items uh, round that out. Other than that, not a lot has changed. So if you'd like to have a public hearing, we can go that route. Yeah, we, sorry. Yeah, we have we to have go that to route. Have it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to open the public hearing. Do we have any comments from the public? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? There you go, Mr. Palomo. Thank you. Oh, you're up again. I am here still. Final KMAA for year 2018-19 financial plan, Mr. Palomo. Thank you again. Um, let me first start by apologizing. There was a page that was inadvertently left out of this um, item. I think it was corrected online. And if you have paper copies, it is a page that looks like this. You all have that. But not, again, it's the third time for this document as well. Nothing really has changed. This budget provides for the um, ongoing maintenance of the 511 system, the litter contracts that were just approved, as well as um, changeable message signs. We will be purchasing changeable message signs, which will ultimately go out to your communities in the future. So with that, not let's see if we can have one. We definitely need to have another public hearing. I'm going to open the public hearing. Do we have any comments from the public? I'm going to close the public hearing. And do we have a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? There you go, Mr. Palomo. Thank you. <laughs> Item number six, agreement for safety-related hazard and obstruction removal on state highways. Ms. Napier. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the board. Um, this is the contract that we've had over the last several years with the City of Bakersfield uh, Foundation who use um, people from the homeless shelter or clients, I should say, from the homeless shelter. Again, this year it is in the amount of $150,000 and we're asking for you to approve the memorandum of agreement between current council governments and the City of Bakersfield and authorize the chair to execute the agreement. <coughs> Move to approve. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? There you go, Ms. Napier. We're on a roll here, aren't we, guys? <coughs> Executive Director's Report. Good evening again, Madam Chair and Board Members. Um, last week, uh, Mayor Wegman and uh, Ms. Napier and I attended a San Joaquin Valley Policy Council meeting with the other COGS throughout the San Joaquin Valley in Modesto, productive meeting, talked about issues of uh, concern to all of us. Um, Supervisor Perez was uh, there as well as um, the county roads director, Craig Pope, who made presentations to the entire S San Joaquin Valley. Uh, the I mentioned this last month, Kern COGS um, joint meeting with Southern California Association of Government, the MPO just to our south, and the largest MPO in the United States, 
is scheduled for Thursday, May 24th, uh, lunch meeting in Valencia. Currently, I have uh, Supervisor Couch, Supervisor Scribner, and um, Chairman Wegman coming. If you would like to attend that meeting, uh, please let me know in the next uh, week or two. It, w it will be a lunch. I'm sorry. Please <laughs> let me know in the next few days. The meeting is next Thursday. Uh, there will be an Air District Public Workshop uh, to identif identify processes for the San, Ma San Joaquin Valley communities recommended for additional clean air resources under AB 617. That will be at 5.30 p.m. on May 29th via video conference at the Air District's Bakersfield office, which is just north of 7 Standard Road. 34 946 flyover court if you're interested in that and it is likely to affect uh, the city of Arvin and Mayor Garola I can talk to you on on the side if you'd like about that the 55 day public review period for the 2018 RTP our SCS and the 2019 FTIP and conformity we will begin May 18th which is tomorrow and end July 12th the 45-day public review period for the program environmental impact report will begin on May 25th. And as a reminder, we will uh, absolutely need a quorum for our August 16th meeting. So if you could put that on your calendars now, August 16th, and I'll have extra special dinner for all of you. <laughs> the public hearings for the RTP, SES, and uh, air quality conformity there will be three separate public hearings. One will be Wednesday, June 6th in Ridgecrest, Tuesday, June 19th in Arvin, Thursday, June 21st here at our meeting in Kern Cog, at, at Kern Cog. In your folders this evening is a copy of the ITS plan that was presented earlier today, that Kern Motorist Aid Authority spreadsheet. If you're interested in more details on the community survey that was presented earlier today, just the cover sheet to that item with a link on there that's easy to get to. The timeline for the next four months, schedule of our cash disbursements for April, a copy of an article about um, Bakersfield approval of the station area plan from the Bakersfield Californian, a notice of the public workshop that I just mentioned from the San Joaquin Valley Air District, and also probably in front of you is the notice of the Freeman Gulch ribbon cutting and uh, several pieces of information about the homeless presentation. Subject to any questions you have, Madam Chair, that concludes my report. Any questions for the director? Madam Chair. Mr. Hakimi, um, would you be willing to eventually send me some information as I was sitting here? I was wondering when was the most recent traffic study on Highway 43 from, say, Delano through Shafter? Would be able to connect on that later? Absolutely. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, we have any, is there any members, any uh, statements? If not, we're going to, you do? <coughs> yeah, I just want to say thank you uh, to KernCog and to all the other member cities on the uh, Kern Motors Aid Authority and the, the money that goes for litter pickup. That's definitely cleaned up the Bakersfield community. I know we work with the Sheriff's Department and all the outlying communities, but when we first started that program a few years ago, the, the litter was horrendous everywhere and it much much better and it, you know and it's also a win-win because we get the uh, homeless shelter involved and people back on their feet so thank you may, may I add on to that uh, madam chair yes so uh, council member Smith is, is being real modest we were we were on the cutting edge nationwide with investing in in that money with litter pickup with the homeless, it is spreading to the rest of the state and the rest of the country rapidly. So c congratulations to, to all of you. I regularly get calls about how did, how did you do this? 
how are you doing it, how is it working um, from uh, states all throughout the country and counties. A as an example, Fresno County is about to implement a very similar pro program. Congratulations to all of you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, we have a uh, closed session, so this meeting's adjourned. Thank you. Okay, we're back in uh, session. Um, we have no reportable action at That's this right. time. This meeting's adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Charles.